So welcome everyone to this side event of the 2022 High Level Political Forum, organized by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, which brings together global cultural networks looking to make sure that we really are realizing the potential of culture, cultural institutions and cultural actors to deliver on the sustainable development goals and to plan for the future. The topic of our session today is from local perspectives to global principles. And we're here, we're here in order to talk about that, in order to talk about how we can really learn from what's going on in terms at the local level, in terms of integrating culture into development planning, in order to think about how can we do things better at the global level. It was welcome to hear in yesterday's local government session at the High Level Political Forum about the really high level of engagement that there is at this level of government. But of course, also about the ensure importance of ensuring that this potential to, to contribute is fully realized in national planning. And this is particularly true when it comes to culture. Now, it's important to clarify here that we're not just talking about cultural industries, institutions and professionals, but also about culture in terms of the way that we think, that we live. It's therefore not just about jobs and growth, although, of course, these are important. It's also about well-being and learning, social cohesion and social capital, and crucially about the behaviour change that is necessary, that's essential for policy effectiveness. Because the sort of transformative change that the 2030 agenda demands is not something that can be achieved from the top down. We need to engage and enable communities to ensure that they have the possibilities, the opportunities, the tools to enjoy their rights, to realise their potential. And of course, we need to take a proactive attitude to addressing the habits and attitudes that can delay development and that are often, if not always rightly, associated with culture. We can only do this by making sure that the level of government that is closest to people, that understands them best, feeds in, shares its ideas and has a central role. So this session is therefore about learning about how culture, cultural actors, institutions and factors are being integrated into efforts to deliver on the decade of action and what lessons we can draw from this for work globally. Now I'll shortly hand over to Ege who will present about some of the work that's already being done and then subsequently we'll go on to hear some people who can talk from their own experience of what's happening, the great experiences that there are already. But I wanted to start by running a couple of quick polls in order to see, to think, hear your views and to, to get you thinking about this role already. So you should have up on the screen for our attendees a series of questions. The first one is about how important a role culture has in achieving sustainable development. The second is about how well culture is integrated into national development strategies. And the third is about how well culture is integrated into local and regional development strategies. So the poll is open now. That's great, we're starting to get responses in. So I'll give you just a few minutes more, perfect. I'm conscious there's three questions there. So right, we're up to around a quarter. Great, I'll give you, let's say 30 more seconds so that then we can get onto our speakers, we're nearly halfway. It's great, over halfway. So let's do 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and share those results. So you should see them up on the screen. Now, I guess, of course, I don't know, if we have a session talking about the role of culture and sustainable development, it's not surprising that a lot of people think that it's essential or very important. But what's interesting is that, as you can see in the responses to the second and third questions, most people and see that culture is it's present, but it's really not at the heart. And the set both goes at the global level and at the local level. So we'll be asking those polls again at the end, putting those polls to you again at the end. But what I want to do first then is hand over to Ege to talk about what the evidence says, what we can learn from voluntary local reviews of SDG implementation. So with that, over to you, Ege. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen uh, with the slides I have for you today. Can you see it all right? Yes, that's working well. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, so uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, the ones in New York at the HLPF in person. And uh, hello to, um, to anyone else around the world. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, as Stephen said, uh, we're excited to share um, findings and uh, some progress in our work at the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign um, regarding um, integrating culture into the SDG um, implementation processes and um, policy debates. Um, so um, I think I have about 20 minutes um, to first uh, give you um, an overview of um, the reports that we've been uh, preparing, uh, prepared for, um, recently as part of the campaign. Um, only uh, the, the findings up to the findings and then um, the recommendations we, um, we'll say for the end. Um, so um, I'll... Uh, start talking about the report now. Uh, so in 2019, um, uh, the Culture 2030 Goal um, campaign commissioned um, a report uh, to analyze the voluntary national reviews um, to see how culture was placed in it. And then in 2021, we um, elaborated further on this topic with uh, an analysis of the voluntary local reviews. So um, this is this presentation will be focusing more on the second report, the VLR report, but we'll give you uh, some background um, on, on what happened before as well. Um, I'm uh, representing ICOMOS, one of the member um, uh, organizations of the campaign, International Council on Monuments and Sites. Uh, we deal mainly with cultural heritage, um, that aspect of culture, but uh, increasingly we appreciate the uh, transversal nature of all uh, cultural um, industry um, actors um, uh, and topics, and not only um, uh, between us, but also with other non-culture uh, topics as well, of course, um, development and culture and human life are, um, are all integrated. Uh, so uh, you know about the SDGs reporting process, the VNRs, um, and uh, the increasing recognition of um, how uh, any achievement of sustainable development and its goals go through local action. Um, this has been uh, proven time and again and, and recognized at the high level, talking about more than 60% of the targets uh, being implemented locally, for example. Uh, and in the last uh, several years, five to five years or so, uh, there has been a very strong voluntary local review movement, you know, so the local government answer or the, um, the, the version um, of the VNRs. Uh, and this has not only been um, spearheaded by some uh, strong leading um, city governments like New York and uh, some gov uh, local governments in Japan, but also at the UN level uh, by UN Habitat. Uh, UCLG, the United Cities Local Governments Network, um, has collaborated with UN Habitat closely, um, especially through the Global Task Force on Local and Regional Governments. Uh, they have uh, produced a platform to actually showcase all the VLRs that are being done so far, not only the VLRs themselves, but also um, guidelines on how to write a good, effective VLRs. Um, the two uh, first uh, um, reports uh, came in 2016, and then in 2018, as I said, New York and, and three Japanese cities, they came together uh, to start this um, uh, collective uh, VLR declaration, um, talking about um, um, how si all, many, many cities should do these VLRs, um, and uh, um, actually asking for a commitment from uh, lo local governments to, to uh, start preparing these, and uh, indeed, um, there is a serious um, uh, blossoming um, explosion, actually, um, of uh, VLRs being prepared more and more each year. Uh, we see this. Um, let me see. Yes. Uh, so uh, we, as the Culture 2030 Gold Campaign, um, we've been following uh, the, these uh, processes closely as much as we can. Um, of course, our campaign has the ultimate goal of having a proper culture goal with a capital G, you know, like one of the 17 uh, goal themes, like po ending poverty, hunger, we want one devoted to culture, really. Um, and we do believe, as in, in the Barcelona VLR, um, having expressed it very well in 2019, achieving sustainable development will ask for us to review our values and priorities of life, which cannot be done without culture. Um, so this campaign um, really goes back um, to it, a while now. Its roots are actually in the pre-SDG period uh, when the Culture 2015 campaign advocated for a culture goal in our um, current framework, the SDGs. That didn't quite happen the way that, um, that was uh, desired. 
um, there was a, a certain um, set of declarations, manifestos on how uh, certain progress was made, but important steps uh, still remained. Um, and then uh, the campaign was revitalized in a way uh, in, around 2019. Um, uh, when we actually started to uh, talk about uh, analyzing um, VNRs uh, in, in terms of culture. And then the COVID-19 um, pandemic broke out, of course, and we responded to that um, in emphasizing how um, culture is also at the heart of uh, pandemic recovery um, and how uh, the cultural sector uh, has been actually a crucial lifesaver um, for well-being, mental health during this time, but also severely impacted and we should not be left behind in recovery packages, of course. You are welcome to visit our website and please do sign our statement. It's still open to signature. Uh, we're also collaborating with other networks such as the Climate Heritage Network, uh, climate being our uh, biggest crisis um, and biggest topic uh, in today's societies. Uh, we cannot ignore the, um, the interlinkages of the cultural um, dimensions of sustainability and climate action and adaptation mitigation as well. Um, so the 2019 report um, focusing on the VNRs, um, uh, I'll just briefly mention some findings. Um, so we did find some uh, very positive um, presence of uh, cultural themes and policies and ambition in some uh, country reports. Some re countries are already aware of this and they already de de somehow uh, embrace culture in their development policy, but uh, really not enough, we, we could say. Um, the way that cultural actors expect and imagine is a culture integration into SDGs, you know, um, is, is quite different from the level that um, uh, an average VNR shows. You know, many VNRs don't really talk about culture at all. Uh, there are very interesting evidences of different pro policies programs in certain SDGs. SDG 11, of course, uh, the 11.4 target on cultural heritage, natural heritage protection is a big help. Of course, 4.7 education um, for a culture of uh, peace, uh, that also helps also on five gender and eight among cultural products for um, cultural sustainable tourism, uh, in cultural addressing inequalities, um, cul cultural addressing um, consumption and um, production patterns and um, the um, relations with, again, through tourism mainly of, of ecosystems protection and uh, peace, of course. So we did see a lot of potential and diversity in the VNRs already. Um, and we uh, really were very curious to see how this would play out in at the local level where we uh, were already um, understanding and I mean observing that uh, local governments um, have a better grasp of culture due to the um, inherent aspects the, the nature of culture cultural diversity being closer to citizens uh, understanding cultural contexts um, so forth various reasons for this and we did um, indeed see these in the VLR reports um, in this way VLRs are stronger in culture and actually the poll that was just made uh, today by you, um, our participants, uh, there is um, or already an agreement on that. Uh, the, uh, the question on local uh, policy integration uh, for culture shows that you believe it's uh, stronger uh, than in the uh, national level. So it's nice to see that alignment um, over there. Uh, so for the 2021 VLRs report, um, uh, we had uh, 73 VLRs that uh, we were able to analyze. Uh, we had to have a cutoff date. Uh, it's a little more difficult to actually keep up, keep track of VLRs because we, there is no set deadline like the UN has for VNRs. VLRs can be uh, uploaded, prepared, uh, shared any time of the year. Uh, so we um, uh, had to use a cutoff date of um, May 2021 uh, when we had 73 on the gold platform. Uh, you can uh, access these all on this website. Uh, we um, also did not include in this analysis uh, the voluntary subnational reviews. Uh, those are for whole of country um, uh, policy analysis um, at the local government level. Um, also, uh, Let's see, uh, the, the, the ones that we did include, uh, included uh, 75 LRG territories. Actually, we like to use in the report um, the term LRG rather than just LG, local governments or cities, because uh, regions or at the federal states uh, context, for example, um, they also uh, produce um, important reports um, that, that we counted um, as VLRs. Uh, 23 countries, five regions, the Arab region was missing. Now we have some Arab region VLRs, but uh, they're not included in this analysis. Um, total population of uh, 100 and, 
um, 10 million um, people represented um, and also two times submitters, now three times submitters, I think, just like the VNRs. Some have made it an institutional tradition already, uh, which is great. Uh, so the methodology we used was uh, looking, um, looking at the guidelines and how much uh, the guidelines were adhered to in a way, or um, also the guidelines helped us to approach the subject um, of how to see culture um, was integrated. We did a quantitative analysis, a keyword count basically, and qualitative analysis, looking at the kinds of approaches, um, the, um, the, the types of concepts used, the mentions, um, and also looking at exemplary content that we can highlight um, as, as good practices uh, to follow, to model in other places, to replicate. So you see a map here of, of the VLRs at that time, the ones already done and in process. Now it's of course much more crowded. Um, so looking at the quantitative analysis, um, just checking time, um, well, um, we were looking at how uh, many times the uh, words culture and cultural uh, were uh, encountered as opposed to social, society, economic, econ economy, and environment, environmental, you know, the, the, the dimensions of sustainable development. And uh, we believe that uh, the, the culture is the fourth dimension. So um, how, if we all had to put these in a pie, um, what would be their share? Um, well, in the national uh, level at the VNRs, this came out to be 5% only. Um, and one of our recommendations in the VNR report was to have this at least um, as close to um, as the next one, as at, 20, um, at least about 20, 25%. Um, at the 2021 20, um, VLRs uh, report, we saw that culture was um, mentioned 30, um, at 13%, so uh, better than the VNRs um, compared to the subsets, uh, to the other dimensions, sorry, as you can see here. Uh, then we looked at uh, uh, what kinds of terms within the cultural realm, uh, you know, uh, the cultural industries, cultural sector were used. The, the 10 most frequent terms encountered were the word cultural itself. Um, actually, that is an interesting point to dwell on um, maybe um, later or, or in, um, at another time in depth, because the word culture itself is tricky. It can mean so many different things. It can be, um, uh, it, it, it can be handled in a very narrow scope or in a very wide scope. And what we desire, um, I could say, for the campaign is looking at this at the wider scope, um, at the more anthropological point, not just arts or, you know, uh, opera or music or exhibitions, paintings, fine arts, but about, as Stephen said, behavior change, a culture of sustainability, um, etc. So that lots of different ways of the word culture, cultural uh, can be addressed. Um, actually, we did see in the reports that the word culture was addressed in very different ways, implicitly. I don't know if anybody was really aware of the cultural dimension when they talked about a culture of sustainability, but they did say that a lot, to be honest. Uh, knowledge, of course, buildings relating to heritage, um, arts, artistic um, heritage, language, libraries a lot, recreation and preservation. Preservation is also an interesting word. Nature preservation, nature conservation, uh, social protection, social conservation of um, other resources, uh, natural resources. Um, we also disaggregated that data um, as well. Um, so culture was used as a general concept a lot and um, the most frequent use of cultural was heritage. Uh, other terms uh, that we, we find an affinity with culture are cities and urban, of course, uh, the social dimension, education, um, also economy and gender. Um, and these shared words, um, both in the cultural and non-cultural context were a local protection, conservation, preservation, restoration. Um, then we did a kind of uh, ranking to, to have some productive suite kind of competition among cities. Um, and this was uh, measured in terms of um, the number of words per, per page um, and also the, the uh, level of diversity, what, how many types of different uh, cultural terms were used. Um, and when we looked at the overall picture, uh, the top 10 come out as Suwon from Republic of Korea, Besançon from France, they're already two time submitters, Hawaii, Hawaii has a lot of nature culture connections and a very uh, much, much more indigenous heritage and holistic uh, cultural um, perspective. I think that's a very interesting v VLR, to be honest, Hawaii, Mexico City, Nior again from France, uh, Niteroi from Brazil, La Paz from Bolivia, Besançon and Trujillo from Peru. Um, and also it was in, um, worthwhile to uh, dwell on um, 
something maybe not so obvious that is an indicator of how culture is um, present in there in these reports is by the visuals. You know, a, a picture can tell a thousand words. And um, in so many um, instances, uh, colorful um, images, uh, graphics, um, illustrations were used to make a point and to really um, uh, add more ambition and emphasis and passion to a project. And um, sometimes there were messages implicit in these photos that were not necessarily written in the texts. So we thought it would be uh, worthwhile to look at these covers and a very um, high level of usage of uh, cultural themes in the covers, you know, 70% um, of VLRs. Um, and looking at the qualitative analysis, uh, what was said in the reports um, relevant to culture, uh, we're seeing um, a sense of pride and ownership, uh, cultural heritage, um, very um, age old ingrained uh, positive aspects, uh, character uh, traits uh, of cities and populations, uh, places are emphasized. Uh, there is cul cultural uh, pl policies uh, presence in strategic planning frameworks sometimes. Um, the King in China is talking about a land of harmonious livelihood integrated within its deep rooted culture, for example. Um, Neo the Nior's Nior roadmap talks about um, a challenge of a human, cultural, and safe city. So it's also interesting uh, to see how cities. Um, connect a, um, a cultural theme with other themes. Um, so here, safety and culture come together, for example, as well as um, a human city. Um, sometimes cultural ministries are involved in cultural, um, um, in v VLR preparations, cultural actors, NGOs are in sometimes very closely involved. Um, uh, in um, the Basque country, uh, the Agenda Euskadi, um, the governance and coordination um, of the um, of, of the 2030 strategy um, was um, proclaimed to be um, completed by the participation of social, economic, and cultural agents. So they they were deliberately looking at cultural agents um, in the preparation process of the VLRs. Um, and the most prominent goals uh, that we saw were um, SDG 1, 4, 11, and 10. Um, to be honest, um, this is slide is from an interim presentation um, back in September um, when we presented this, this at the Izmir Culture Summit. So um, there's a, another slide coming up um, later that, that um, um, updates this, this, uh, this, this information here. Um, uh, talking about uh, the youngest, uh, the future generations that we need to reach um, and uh, uh, culture and education can play a strategic role here. Uh, in the means of uh, implementation, uh, cultural data collection, for example, in Barcelona, there's a, um, a very strong um, project uh, for this um, financing. Um, again, the behavioral change maker recognition is here and the cultural aspect of participation and, and diversity, um, again. Um, Yes, culture is seen by cities as a crucial component. There is great diversity um, connected with various other themes, um, sometimes as a separate policy heading, um, sometimes often um, sometimes placed under cultural services. Uh, but we, we believe that uh, it could still feature more as a main policy driver. Um, here you see La Paz's main strategic framework. Um, and uh, here um, culture um, features quite strongly at the um, biggest framework that they that they present the the la paz feliz the happy the intercultural and the inclusive la paz um you see there for example so um we hope to see more of these kinds of um, um proclamations done at the outset that uh, color the whole gamut of their policy making um using cultural aspects. Here's a little um, selection of all the different ways that um, cities uh, talk about culture. It's very creative, um, talking about empowerment, the youth again, um, social well-being, um, resilience, of course, um, and um, <clears throat> the way that uh, Scotland, for example, um, it has a very good climate connection as well. They're talking about physical evidence for human activity that connects people with place, for example. Uh, Espo from Finland talks about culture as the DNA of the city. Um, I'm just checking for time, a few minutes left. Uh, so uh, one thing is um, some goals are stronger than others, of course, but we there are clues about how all goals can have um, similar ways of culture integration in them. So I, maybe from um, looking forward, um, the goals that are that seem to have a weaker culture link need to have um, more boost in advocacy. 
uh, to show connections, uh, to, to um, support um, actors that are in our reach, to actually think about uh, connections between um, the, these weaker goals and culture. So here's um, the set of most prominent SDGs. Um, these are the obvious ones. These are um, already in good shape. Um, easier um, situation here. Um, 11 again, cities of course, 10 on inequalities, education, um, work and um, economic growth um, and uh, peace and governance. Uh, at the mid level, we see um, poverty, um, health, gender, um, production, consumption and partnerships. Um, at the, and you see the ones at the weakest level. And uh, these seem to be somehow related to the people P, you know, the five P's um, in, in the SDGs framework, people, planet, prosperity, peace, partnerships. Um, the ones that seem weak seem to be more in the environmental uh, nature conservation field, uh, strangely, perhaps. Uh, the culture nature connection is now something obvious to us, um, but it needs to be advocated more to all development actors. You see climate at 13, um, land ecosystems, um, underwater ecosystems, um, energy um, and water. So uh, these are uh, like this. Uh, so uh, these are our main findings, but I, I, I need to um, make a pause here. Um, and after listening to our um, other presenters with their uh, in-depth uh, case studies, I think it'll be uh, more interesting to talk about recommendations for the way forward. Uh, Stephen, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ega. That, that was fantastic. And I think sort of the comment was made in the chat, simply setting things out in that way is a great way of showing firstly the level of engagement that there already is at the macro level, and also the quality of it, and the breadth of issues where culture can make a difference if it's realised, if it's actually put to work. And, and that's something that local governments certainly seem to be doing better than national governments. So uh, as you said, we will come on to recommendations later, but in order to jump from the, to go from the, 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 the macro level, the statistical level, we're really glad now to be joined by four um, panelists who will each sort of talk about their own experiences of how culture is being put to use. So culture, cultural institutions, cultural industries, cultural practitioners, but cultural factors as well in order to make for successful local development. So first of all, we are really honored to be joined by Enrico Avogadro, Enrique Avogadro, who is the Minister for Culture for the city of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And he brings together experience, not only of driving cultural policy at the local level, but also at the national level, and a really strong international perspective through his studies and through his work. So with that, Your Excellency, I'd like to hand over to you, Mr. Avogadro. Thank you, Stephen, and, and um, we're really glad to be part uh, of this uh, amazing panel. Thank you, Ege, for your introduction. It was really deep and, and colorful. Um, we are really honored to, to be part of, of this conversation, and we're pleased to share our own experience. Uh, we are co-presidents of UCLG uh, Culture uh, um, Council, so um, we're also representing cities all around the world that are working around best practices in terms of culture and development. Um, and for us, this meeting is really, really important in, in order not to lose sight of the work that each one of us uh, is doing in terms of promoting their place uh, and, and the role of culture, you know, uh, as a fundamental uh, tool for development in our cities, especially uh, in this time where we are hopefully leaving behind or at least uh, being able to cope with this pandemic and, and trying to <clears throat> bring with us some uh, learning experiences and, and, and best practices, uh, understanding and, and thinking of culture as much more than an entertainment tool. Culture as a tool for development, <clears throat> as a way to build our identity individually, but, but basically collectively. And in that sense, expanding access to culture, it's really our main challenge because by expanding culture, we're really able to build citizenship in our, in our cities. <clears throat> of course, this is really beautifully said, but not that easy uh, to be done. So <clears throat> I want to share with you some uh, experiences 
from our city, from Buenos Aires in Argentina, Buenos Aires being the capital city of Ar Argentina in South America. It's a quite a big city, <clears throat> 3 million and a half inhabitants. But when you take into account the great city of Buenos Aires, the, 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 the larger metropolitan area, we're talking about a city of around 13, 14 million people, um, people coming and going. And um, again, what we say is that culture has a fundamental role in society to really achieve this inclusion of people. And that's why we aim to show all the networks that are in a sense woven, you know, in solidarity to sustain <clears throat> this idea of a community. Um, the, the Ministry of Culture of the City of Buenos Aires is directly in charge of a wide network of um, cultural equipments, including uh, big venues like Teatro Colón, uh, a very large network of public uh, libraries, of museums, of theaters all around the city. But also, and, and that's why we think that it's really important to, to think in, some, in, the, in, in a way as a, uh, an ecosystem where we are not only in charge of cultural public policies and public cultural public venues, but also to, to bring in a, a, a very large perspective, taking into account also the private side of culture, the community side of culture, and especially in our city, the what we call the independent cultural scene, more than 500 cultural venues that are run independently by very small cultural arts and cultural organizations, which are really important for us in terms of bringing diversity for our cultural scene and also being a, a very important part of um, our wider challenge of expanding access to culture. Because we live in a city where we have the privilege of living very close to uh, uh, one of these independent cultural venues. And one challenge for the local government is how to bring in all these uh, very diverse actors to the conversation and in a way um, make them also co-responsible of our cultural policies in our city. For Buenos Aires, is the SDG agenda is it's key and, and that's why we promote initiatives that can be replicated in a way to rebuild a more equitable and sustainable world. <clears throat> I want to share with you some very practical um, um, lessons that we learned from, from these initiatives. And the first one is called Pase Cultural. Pase Cultural or Cultural Pass is basically, um, it's a, a directed especially to socialize and culture and it's catered towards young, youngsters um, that are attending public schools in uh, the city of Buenos Aires. It's a sort of credit card, it's not credit, it's, it's a card that we provide to young people that are attending public schools in the city of Buenos Aires. And we put in that card money, real money, it's a sort of grant that they can only use in cultural activities. Uh, whatever they want to do, but it has to be culture. So they can use this card, this money to buy books. They can go to a museum, to a theater, to a movie theater. They can attend uh, music performances, any relate cultural related activity. And we're not deciding what they do with this because a key a lesson from this um, initiative is that what we, we, what we provide is um, the liberty for them to uh, to choose whatever they want to do. Why we do this? Because we are convinced that we need everyone to be uh, participating actively in the cultural ecosystem. And if we can provide young people with the tools to be um, members of the cultural society, we are in a sense, as I said before, building citizenship in our city. It's a very successful program uh, that we're running uh, in all the public schools in our city. And uh, what we are learning from this experience is that when you provide young people with the tools to be, um, as I said, really active in the cultural field, 
they end up in a way also uh, teaching us what they, of course, what they want to do, what is missing from this program. And they are not only teaching us, the public officers, but also they are teaching the, the wider cultural ecosystem. Because by choosing what they do with this money, they are saying what they like and what they don't like. Actually, there are some disciplines that are not that demanded by youngsters. So that there is a challenge, for instance, in, in the theater field, how they can bring up a theater place that can be really interesting for people from 16 to 18, 19 years old. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do with this is what we, we were trying to sort of provide this cultural citizenship. citizenship. If, you, if you live in a city where culture is so important as Buenos Aires, you should have a, a right to be an active member of the cultural society. Um, so Cultural Paz or Pase Cultural uh, has been running for the last four years. And uh, we have all sort of data around this program because we built it from scratch uh, with a control um, environment and, and, and with our data um, team, we've been able to really understand what is going on uh, um, within the program. And we are happy to share, of course, not here, but we are happy to share this experience with colleagues from other cities all around the world, because we, we feel that it's, it's a very important program. Uh, it's, it's the first time that in our country, we are promoting cultural demand. We are always dealing with policies on the supply side. And this is one policy that is uh, run from the demand side in a sort of a, it's, it's a sort of voucher scheme related to culture and catered towards youngsters at public schools. A second initiative that I want to share with you, it's called Abasto Barrio Cultural uh, or Abasto Cultural Neighborhood. Abasto is um, uh, one of the most interesting neighborhoods in the city of Buenos Aires. Uh, a neighborhood that it used to be, and it's still related to tango. Of course, you might know about tango, this music genre that is danced all around the world, and it was born in our city. Uh, but now it's also a, a neighborhood related to these independent cultural spaces or venues. There, there is a large community of independent cultural theaters and music venues, but also bars and restaurants that have culture uh, as a, a key uh, part of their identity. So um, several years ago, we started working with them um, in, a, in, in, in and the community um, on cultural projects that address the appreciation of local identities and the, the strengthening of, of all these independent cultural expressions as a way of guaranteeing access and participation in, in the cultural life. Um, and it has been really successful because we, we were able to, to bring them on to the conversation on the same sort of leveling the playing field. Um, it's not always easy from the public side of the equation, the government side of the equation to, um, to all build this sort of conversations with the uh, fiercely, fiercely independent cultural scene. You, you need to win their, uh, their trust. You, you, build, you need to build confidence. And our team has been able to, to actually do this through um, a very patient one-to-one -one and, and one-to-many uh, sort of conversations. And uh, we've been, as I said, really successful because we were able to, to build not only the, the conversation realm, but through this, through this conversation and collaboration, we've been working uh, in several projects within the neighborhood, building the neighborhood as a, an independent cultural neighborhood. It's a Abasto Barrio Cultural, it's a comprehensive project uh, that understands culture and community action as articulating access of transformation. Um, and it, uh, again, it has been really, really successful with several projects bringing culture to the public realm. We've been able to cope with the pandemic more strongly in Abasto because we already had all these local linkages going on. 
we actually um, built all these uh, programs in the public realm because uh, at, at, at the height of the pandemic, we weren't able to run cultural activities within the inside these cultural venues. So what we did is we closed several streets and we bring them, we brought them out to the streets um, to meet their neighbors and, and, and being able to, to continue with their activities um, uh, in the public realm. Um, we're very proud because with this project, we just uh, won the uh, UCLG Mexico City Award and we will be uh, attending the, the award ceremony in, the, um, in Mexico at the end of this year. And it's going to run at the same time as uh, Mondia Cult in Mexico. Again, this is another activity that we are proud to share with you uh, and where we have all the details and, 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 and information about the meetings and, and learning uh, best practices that we're, we're bringing with, uh, from this experience. The third and last experience or initiative that I want to share with you, it's called Buenos Aires International Production. And it's basically <clears throat> a cash rebate scheme related to the film uh, industry in our city. Buenos Aires has a very large um, film community. And this is part of um, our cultural and creative industries ecosystem, which is really, really strong. Around 10% of the economy of our city is related to arts, culture, and especially the cultural and creative industries, our creative economy. Um, it's a city of talent, the city of Buenos Aires. We are exporting cultural and creative services all around the world. And we are trying to promote these cultural and creative sectors as a way of promoting development, as a way of creating the kind of jobs that we need to create. <clears throat> Understanding that in a cultural and creative city, you need to be um, promoting these cultural and creative industries, again, as a way of um, taking uh, a, into account your creative community. So <clears throat> in a way, it's part of course of the SDG goals because we are, our aim is to promote the environment to generate prosperity in the community. And within this framework, we are launching, we've launched this initiative. Um, it's a sector, the film, the audiovisual sector, that it's also not only important in terms of its direct impact in our economy, but also in terms of its, its indirect impact. Through promoting this sector, we are also being able to promote gastronomy, transportation, um, of course, tourism related services, professional services, and not only within our city, but also in our country. Argentina being a big country with several regions with several weathers, climates, and opportunities. By um, coming to Buenos Aires to, to film, you're also being able to access the rest of our country. In concrete, what we did is we launched this cash rebate initiative that it's um, in a sort mirrored in several international experiences and trying to learn from the experiences mainly at the national level. There are fewer experiences at the city level, but we are trying to bring new international projects to, to our city for film, TV series, and, and ad commercials, working, of course, hand in hand with local producing companies. And through this scheme, also bringing not only new projects, but also new opportunities to, to learn from these international projects. Again, this is a, economic, a creative economy related tool that we've been running uh, for several years. We, we just launched this initiative, the Cash Rebate Initiative, but it's part of a wider program related to the cultural and creative industries. We have a creative district policy in our city. Uh, within the city, we, we have some areas designated at, as creative districts where we provide some um, tax 
<coughs> redemptions, but we are also working with the local community in, in a way to build them as creative districts. So three different initiatives, Pase Cultural, Abasto, Barrio Cultural, and Buenos Aires International Production that are part, of course, at a much wider uh, toolbox that we are running. But all these initiatives we, we think are really related to um, this challenge that we, 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 we have ahead, which is learning from, from our experiences in a way also to as, as <clears throat> this panel is, is, is you know, um, in a sort of proposing, which is to build back better globally through the SDG implementation. And again, we are really glad and thankful to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much. And I would love to stay in touch with our colleagues from all around the world, you know, to, to share much more information from these experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Minister Avogadro. And I felt in particular it was, it was really rich to have that variety of examples from the different ways in which initiatives around culture can make a difference on a variety of goals. And I think in particular that point about the, the unique position that local government can have as a place where you can have those sorts of conversations that really bring together the top down and bottom up, which simply isn't necessarily easily done at the national level. I thought that was, that was a really interesting example, simply showing not just that culture is important, but how you can make that work. So thank you very much for your intervention. I think now we're going to pass on to our next speaker, who is Stefan Falkman who is a consultant at KPMG with a strong specialization in the public sector. And he has a background in library and information science and has worked extensively around questions of urban development and learning cities, including a stint at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. So with that, um, Stefan, over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I hope you can hear me well, because apparently I have renovations going on in my house. So if you hear a little bit background noise, I hope it's not too disturbing. Um, thank you very much in any case for inviting me here. Um, uh, I think your introduction was, was, was perfect, uh, especially together with Lisa Kolak, who is actually also here uh, today in the meeting. Um, a few years back, I worked with the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning um, and their um, global network of learning cities on a few case studies, a few of these cities that um, excel very much at using particularly libraries um, to use um, uh, education and culture uh, on an urban scale for uplifting these societies. So in the next um, four or five minutes, I wanna quickly go into what were these case studies about or what was our work about. Then I wanna give you a little bit of a context of what these uh, of, of, of these two cities, in this case, I'll use Medellin from South America, from Colombia, and Hume, a, a, a suburb to Melbourne in, Austri uh, in Australia. And then I'll go a little bit into what we learned from those, um, on a broader scale for running these, um, these library settings um, and what they teach us or what, can, what they can give us along for uh, accelerating the SDGs with culture. Um, so to get started with this, um, um, we see that a lot of cities that are looking into using education and culture uh, for, let's say, revitalization purposes for um, getting their city back on the map as we often hear, um, they actually use built architecture to get this working. So these can be libraries, that can be school buildings, museums, um, or other forms of embodying culture. Um, oftentimes these buildings are nowadays also fused together. So you can see um, shopping centers with a library and a cinema and, and all these kinds of things. Um, so it's getting really creative and it's targeting um, people where they're needed the most. That's actually where these two cases come in. Um, besides these two cases in Medellin in, in Colombia and Hume in uh, Melbourne, Australia, we, there's a lot of other places where this is happening. And apparently we looked in uh, also on the academic side into uh, dozens, if not hundreds of cases where we see very similar patterns of these buildings coming first of all into the, let's say the mindset of the public, um, being then realized by, by a local governance um, and sustained over the, uh, over the time. 
Um, and we can see that the, the, the principles that are at work in these, um, in these cases are very much the same. I'll look into these principles a little bit later, but first to give you a little bit of, an, um, of a background into what these cases are, these two that I want to highlight, and how they actually are similar and contrasting, um, I'll go into that first. Maybe to start off with Medellin, I'll start off with Medellin because many of you may have heard about the city before in one or the other way. Um, and this is this can be in part because of its history. Um, back in the late 80s, 90s, it was actually one of the uh, biggest crisis uh, centers of uh, drug conflict in, in South America. Um, but it, after the, uh, let's say, the early 90s, it actually shifted in, in through many ways in uh, a political paradigm. And one, um, let's say, avenue of this political paradigm was to actually go back into these um, hilltop uh, suburbs where the biggest conflicts were and revitalize these by um, placing libraries directly into the centers um, of where the conflict happened. This is a little bit similar in Hume, a suburb to Melbourne in Australia, um, which was also in the early 90s rather deprived, high uh, poverty, high youth violence and unemployment. And back then it was um, actually a, a journalist who began advocating for putting the, this suburb back on the map by um, using education and culture through a library setting. Um, this was a little bit, as in, in, in both cases, it was a little bit difficult to begin with um, because it didn't seem to be the obvious way to solve a problem or to get the population to lift itself out of its issues um, through culture and, and education. Um, but through persistence, both in both cases, it took about 10 years before it actually started rooting well before the first libraries were built. We now see these buildings as the core centers of these communities. So if you see anyone um, going to Medellin for tourist reasons, they will most likely take a selfie of these libraries, um, which 20 years back used to be no-go areas at all. So that's how impactful that was. In Hume, it's still an, 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 um, a suburb and it's not as, you could say, touristy, um, but still these places, these libraries serve as um, vital turning points for all types of populations to come together um, for different purposes, meet each other, and, and basically thereby also shape an identity of that place. That's what has been happening. Um, so now you have a little bit of an, an understanding of um, what these two places are about. Now I'm just quickly go into um, some of the core principles that we see at work when when local communities try to revitalize themselves by, uh, let's say, um, urbanism itself. Uh, and the key um, indicator here or the key factor is visionary leadership. It needs at least one person in that community to realize, hey, we can do it with uh, with culture and with education. And we should make it manifest in physical settings. Um, these people usually like then go around and influence others or activate other leaders in politics, in education, in culture to join their vision, build it up, revive, um, cre create attention um, and sustain this idea until it's so obviously in the um, on the political agenda that it has been pulled through. Um, this agenda of putting, of making a space a, um, um, a cultural setting and educational setting um, bring, naturally brings in different groups. And it is in meet, these different groups meeting um, that um, even more leaders are, are shaped. Um, and these can be vitalized to actually engage people in the SDGs. Um, so that libraries, for instance, as settings for culture and education are then used to further promote um, uh, the SDGs and put them on the map. And then suddenly um, um, communities often realize that, hey, I, even though I have a deprived community, I actually have a lot of interest and, and people with lots of ambitions to further these causes. Um, and that's when the, the magic of physical settings for the SDGs comes out. Of course, um, these, ta these tales also have very 
hindering sites. As I said before, it took a long time for these um, settings to emerge or for people to fight for them. And even when they are set up, they need to be maintained. There needs to be sustainable, sustainable funding for this. Um, but the main um, key feature for this is, is, as I said, identifying um, potential people who have a vision in the sets um, and bringing them together, building a community out of this and, and making it manifest in form of physical spaces. That's the key um, sort of principles and factors that we identified. Uh, and I think that sums it very nicely up in um, juxtaposition to the previous speakers. So thanks very much in this case from my side. Thank you very much, Stefan. I think, again, that, that point of the power of cultural centers, not just to achieve cultural goals, but then to be catalyst seed beds for actually achieving broader broader development goals and more explicitly engaging with the SDGs is, is a powerful one, is a helpful one, and, and hopefully encourages a broader reflection on the power of these institutions. Um, I will, because we're running a little bit late, I'm gonna head right now on to Lloyda garcia Fibo, who is an international library consultant and who was already actually very closely involved in the negotiations around the 2030 agenda in the first half of the 2010s. She's a past president of the American Library Association, a past governing board member of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, my employer, and has also led work incredibly actively to build awareness of the SDGs and libraries potential to deliver on them within the US, but also around the world. So with that, thank you for your time, Lloyda, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning from New York to your um, um, time zone. Well, libraries are development accelerators and I'm delighted to share uh, examples about libraries and culture. So these are more local examples. And these are speaking to, for instance, uh, target 4.7 by 2030, ensure that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including appreciation for cultural diversity. And also targets 8.9 and 12.B, which refer to the need to devise and implement policies to promote sustainable tourism, including through local culture and products. So this, these are very local, are for, from libraries in the United States. As chair of the American Library Association's task force on the 2030 UN SDGs, last year I collaborated with a great national team of librarians to design a multi-year strategic plan. And one of the results was a chart featuring public library services, supporting development. And the library selected was the Los Angeles Public Library. And I am happy to share that they are promoting culture very creatively. The library is currently hosting Summer with the Library, Express Yourself. It's a program where participants can register online and earn up to 15 badges by reading or completing an activity. These badges can be entered into branch and grant prize drawing. So it's a way of uh, calling in the community. And there are many ways for participants to express themselves uh, very culturally, creatively. Uh, participants are invited to use their voice this summer in your own creative way. Art, poetry, music, dance, writing, photography, cooking, gardening, community activism, and even skateboarding. And this is a very creative way of promoting culture and linking libraries and different community institutions. Uh, the information on the website is also provided in eight languages spoken by Los Angeles residents, including English, Spanish, Korean, Chinese, Persian and Russian. So libraries are really working hard to connect communities and to promote more culture and education. Um, libraries in New York City are part of Culture Pass. It's a program for card holding patrons, six, uh, 13 years old and older of Brooklyn Public Library, New York Public Library and Queens Public Library. 
If someone has a library card, they can get free admission to dozens of cultural institutions and save money and discover more about the city. Using the library card, New Yorkers can reserve a pass and get free admission to museums, theaters, historical societies, heritage centers, public gardens, and arts, dance, music institutions, and more. These library systems also present cultural arts programs celebrating the cultures, languages, cuisines, cinema, and art of the countries represented in the communities they serve. They have a calendar and have established events such as the Hispanic Heritage Month, the Black History Month, and the Lunar New Year Festival. The libraries are also part of the New York City's Office for Immigrant Heritage Month. It's a month long celebration in April of every year, highlighting the endless contributions and rich histories and unique cultures of the city's diverse immigrant communities. So I would like to encourage everyone to visit the website of the American Library Association's 2030 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for more resources, including free downloadable bookmarks, charts, and posters that can be customized to promote the SDGs. Libraries are development accelerators. All sectors of society must support them. Libraries are great partners in helping communities and countries achieve development. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you today. Thank you so much, Lloyd, and just that really powerful message about the resilience and the resourcefulness and the inventiveness that's present in the cultural sector, oh, my video stop there, that's present in the cultural sector, that's present particularly in libraries in terms of looking out for what can be done, how can we use the resources, the unique place that we have, as you say, to accelerate development. So thank you so much for that. Excellent. Thank you, Lloyd, for sharing that link and do share a link too to the American Library Association work. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Ayanda Labele, who is the Director for Library Services at the Botswana International University for Science and Technology. Um, Ayanda is also has 30 years of experience in the field and has previously worked, in, amongst other things, with the Botswana Institute for Development Policy Analysis. And she also engages very strongly in work around how libraries can promote inclusion. So, with that, I'm going to hand over to Ayanda and hopefully the internet will hold up. Otherwise, I have a holding slide if you want to speak without a camera. Ayanda, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, greetings, everybody. I am Ayanda, as introduced. I am in Botswana and I serve at the Botswana International University of Science and Technology. I would talk briefly on how libraries as cultural institutions are contributing to local development. Um, Loeda has articulated very clearly how library, the, how the, the goals, that the target goals. So I will just not cite those for sake of time. Uh, I'll go straight into saying the libraries in their nature, they are a community space and they enable access to information on economic opportunities, gender equality, quality education, improve the health of the people and how in a way it gives people a sense of belonging. So in my country, the Botswana National Library Services, it's a government directorate, it's a government department. It serves as an umbrella entity in library service provision in the country. So the plans or the agendas or the strategic uh, initiatives that libraries throughout the countries develop, they are pinned to the broader uh, plans of the country. So in a way, our plans for the libraries and for the plans for service provision, be it a public library, a community library, or an academic library, they are interlinked with the national development. And in that way, we don't lose track of the government plan and the, and the, the development goals. So in a way, our libraries are, by providing access to information, 
they are in a way expanding a way of life and a way of culture, which we will agree that it's very much evolving. And in today's uh, information led world, it culture is very, very, very dynamic. So libraries emerge as a learning organization, both for the users and for us as librarians, we are on our toes. We have to keep on learning. And that in a way we are contributing to the goal of education. Um, so libraries, we advocate for lifelong learning or uh, acquisition of knowledge continuously. And in a way that also changes the culture because the more you learn, the more you are aware, then you start doing things differently and inform other people in your networks. Libraries also, um, we uh, advocate for sustainable preservation of knowledge for development. Particularly in our country, we are engaged in indigenous knowledge management systems through the particular outside, particularly our public libraries. They have sessions for storytelling and for creative uh, art programs. And libraries for different occasions, we invite um, prominent community people or relevant community people to give a talk or to give a guidance on a relevant, maybe commemoration of an event. Libraries also in our context here, we are very highly involved, particularly in the intellectual research landscape. We are shaping the culture of research. Remember earlier on, we, I said we are involved in the preservation of local content. So we are involved in the, in the research, local research landscape. We, at the moment, academic libraries in particular are developing institutional repositories. We have introduced, we are talking with our researchers and with our institutions on introducing the transformative agreements for open access to research. And this, we are working in collaboration with the Ministry of Research, Science and Technology. So I'm bringing all this to show that it's not just the culture in the home space, it's also the culture in the learning and the research space. And all that there is interlinking of the libraries, the users, the researchers and government. So there is collaboration of researchers, the publisher, the library, the policymakers. This would enable particularly the creating of visibility of local content, which is one of our key, key, key uh, priorities. Now, and also imagine from the pandemic, most libraries have shifted. We are building a new culture online life is becoming part of our culture. We are, we are introducing social media, emails, virtual communities, both for teaching, learning, research, and recreation. So this on its own is shaping the culture. And mind you, the libraries are free space for access to internet. And if you, you know that in Africa, we have issues of the digital divide. So access to internet is not a given. So for the libraries to be providing access to that, and particularly training the user communities on how to access the technology, the internet, and how to use it profitably, not just for recreation. So this is how the libraries are shaping the living culture, the learning culture, and the research culture. We are also involved in a way you would say then by creating access to our local content. It's also decolonizing knowledge. For example, our librarians not so long ago were involved in a campaign to update content on Botswana in Wikipedia. That is changing the narrative and that is showcasing our culture for who we are and what we want the world to look as it. And that is from the noble work of librarians and they had to learn all that. So by collaborating with museums, archives and, and uh, and, and the libraries, we are also involved in bringing together the local content through the legal repository. I think at that point, Stephen, I would love to pause and wait for any questions if I may get. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayanda. I think that was such a fantastic way, again, of just underlining the sheer breadth 
of what cultural policy and in the case here of support for libraries can achieve. I think the point you made as well about the model of, of multi-level governance, we can call it where you have support from the national level, but then that's combined with what can be done locally by public community, other libraries, in order to deliver on cultural goals is a really, really powerful one. Also the importance of cultural, cultural institutions as catalysts, as meeting spaces, as accelerators, as Lloyd has said, is an excellent, is a really powerful one. And before we actually open up to questions, and, and of course do place comments and questions in the chat, I wanted in fact to go back to Ege to present, well, based on all this experience, based on all this evidence of what can be achieved at the national, at the local level, what in fact are the recommendations? How can we go further? And I suppose linking that to, and what are the lessons we learned for the national level? So over to you, Ege. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, so I'll continue with the slides, but um, um, I have to say I'm quite um, overwhelmed with the information um, processing all the great um, new insights that we've heard. Um, so um, very much in appreciation of all the speakers. Um, just wanted to say thank you um, to everyone. Um, <clears throat> well, well, I'll try to connect uh, our content with what has just been said, but it's, uh, it may be a bit difficult, but you will find them in, in here anyway. Uh, well, um, coming back to our report, um, the recommendations uh, that we had already uh, mentioned in the VNR report in 2019 um, had uh, outlined some avenues of action for all kinds of stakeholders. Um, I think the way that um, our speakers, you know, also uh, both from uh, Buenos Aires government and uh, library institutions, um, we're all giving the same message really, you know, um, the, uh, the, the wide breadth of um, uh, what we can offer, um, our, our cultural resources, and this has to be considered from the outset, um, you know, this has to uh, be harnessed from the beginning of the processes, um, I think. Um, there's a lot of consultation that um, the cultural actors can offer in all these stages of policymaking implementation. Um, and coming together like in events like this today, you know, um, building our coherent community uh, to advocate together um, and make stronger messages, um, you know, shared platforms. Um, there was a high level meeting on culture that uh, was recommended, which has taken place actually uh, last year in May at the UN, UN high level event on culture, for example, and those kinds of events uh, could be continued. Uh, well, data is an issue, better dissemination of existing um, data and collection of new data uh, using the UNESCO indicator framework um, as needed, for example. Uh, again, the local aspect of all this um, and also being self-critical about, you know, um, how we can actually um, uh, proactively reach out um, with our messages uh, to different levels of government or different, you know, um, actors in, in, in our field. Um, and uh, continue to develop partnerships. So these were both valid for the VNRs and for the VLRs really. Uh, but we also added some new recommendations uh, specifically for the local level. Uh, they were ad addressed to the uh, global task team on LRGs as well, uh, main mainstreaming culture into the general review of VLRs. Um, for example, uh, um, while His Excellency Enrique Avogad um, was speaking, um, I was looking for this Paso Cultural in the Buenos Aires VLRs and I couldn't find it. So the Buenos Aires government um, has somehow um, forgotten to mention the Paso Cultural. And hopefully next, in the next VLR they will mention it because it's such a wonderful uh, project, you know. Uh, I think the UCLG award with, with the Abasto will help with that maybe. So, so sometimes um, when we... Um, heighten a certain uh, recognition in, the, in speaking on a culture event, we may not find the reflection in another um, um, more general type of development debate. So um, uh, we, we should keep on um, lobbying for VLRs um, to actually take what, what, what we have to say um, more at heart, more seriously. Um, so synergies of culture and local action, uh, there is UCLG's Culture 21 actions also 
um, engaging cultural actors in the VLR pro uh, preparation process um, and uh, looking at culture in overall development strategies. Um, there are specific tools in the targets and indicators that are more um, explicitly talking about culture that we know of, you know, the existing ones, 4711.483, so forth. Um, looking at the broader impact um, and all the goals, as we were saying, uh, there's also an interesting issue of cultural literacy um, of um, actually understanding the implicit um, presence of culture sometimes to bring it out and actually say it out loud, express um, a cultural factor, not just take it for granted. Um, um, I think the examples that were mentioned today, um, uh, sometimes um, these um, like acupunctural interventions, you know, in the, in the urban landscape, if you have something where people like to come and visit and take pictures of and share around, you know, using digital technologies, uh, using um, vi visual communication, um, this can actually raise awareness for others to realize what's going on, you know, how libraries have an impact on um, uplifting a neighborhood and, and helping the youth, um, for example. Um, so the, these kinds of um, advocacy tools. Um, and there's a decade of action that's still going on. Um, there are various um, plat platforms talking about that. Um, accountability and participation, uh, very much related to um, the cultural field. Um, we also did this culture checklist, uh, something that a VLR preparer uh, could go through to see if culture is in there enough, looking at um, how um, cultural aspects can be used um, in uh, talking about the inspiration and ambition of, of the whole development, a sustainable development um, process, the actors, um, the dimension of sustainability, uh, the strategic review chain, you know, the highest level of policy, the se sectoral policies, projects, uh, monitoring, um, financing, you know, all that value chain, um, looking at each SDG and how culture uh, features there. Um, including some particular targets and indicators. Uh, case studies are always good. People like to see good examples that to inspire. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm I hope, wishing that more people had actually joined us today. Um, as, I, I think it's still a very qu good quality crowd, but you know, we need to disseminate these messages. We, and we, we need to talk about these case studies to bigger audiences all the time. Um, uh, there are there might be special issues, special challenges in, in, in implementing cultural policies, uh, rights issues, access issues, uh, using um, tools like visuals and keywords. So this was our cultural checklist. Um, I think those were the recommendations, but um, you know, um, it's a good time maybe to open it up for more recommendations from our speakers. I don't know what you think about that, Stephen. Here I'm using a different languages for, to thank you all, including mine. Um, hello from Istanbul uh, um, with our rainbow staircases. Something of a protest, you know, protest against things happening in our country. There we go. Thank you so much. In fact, you, you, you took the words out of my mouth that the thing I would like to end on, I apologize, my camera keeps on turning itself off. The thing I'd like to end on will be actually asking our, our, our panelists if they're able to, to give their recommendations. And I think not just on what they what we should be doing right now and how we could better integrate culture into SDG delivery now, but also thoughts of how we could do better in the future. But before I do that, and just in order to give our panelists a couple of minutes to think about that one, I just wanted to check if there are any comments or questions from our participants. Um, I should say, of course, we've been recording this meeting and so we will share this subsequently, including with the links that have been shared so that exactly we can disseminate this further, we can take the news. Um, in particular, I certainly encourage people to draw on that voluntary local review report. It, it's so rich, there's so much in there. Um, in which case, I don't think we are getting any immediate responses. So I think I will hand over immediately to whoever of our panelists would like to, to, to come up with a recommendation at, for what we should do now and what we might want to do in the longer term. Would anyone like to volunteer to go first? Let me take, let me give, take it out. <laughs> Thank you, go for it, Ayanda. <laughs> yeah. Um... From from our side of the world, I would I would recommend uh, a collection preservation, canning, and platforms to showcase um, the culture. 
particularly at the point where I said that the online world is eroding the traditional, traditional culture, if I may say. So there, there is the emerging lifestyles. So we need um, one skills to be able to capture what has been happening and skills to preserve that and then skills to showcase that. Um, I would, I would recommend that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that, that that's a really powerful point. And I think it's something we come across that it's really important that those of us in the cultural field don't stay in the cultural field, that there's an ability to go out to have the skills and the platforms necessary to explain clearly to decision makers across the board why our institutions, our practice, our insights are so important. Lloyd, yes, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, I welcome this opportunity to share uh, a concept that we have followed at the American Library Association Task Force, and it's to create uh, perhaps a chart or a matrix where we can demonstrate or show uh, how libraries are helping communities uh, with culture. And uh, there are so many uh, diverse and creative ways in which libraries all over the world are contributing. And uh, they could be uh, um, aligned with different goals. And so not only for um, other stakeholders to uh, learn how libraries are joining uh, the uh, Agenda 2030, but also for other libraries across the world to uh, realize that they are already in many cases doing this work and they have not perhaps, uh, you know, been aware of it. And um, we have on the uh, ALA's uh, website, different charts uh, per uh, different types of libraries, academic, public, school libraries that uh, could be perhaps uh, uh, used to model this type of matrix. So uh, that's an idea, uh, mainly perhaps for IFLA, uh, but I'm sure that will be helpful for the other different stakeholders and partners around the world. I, 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 absolutely, I think I know from my own experience, I think we can only agree that it's by making things clear, not only that we can communicate more effectively with broader decision makers to make it explicit how there is a cultural dimension to what they're doing, but how there's also a cultural dimension to the solution of the challenges that they face, but also crucially within the cultural field, how can we make it, again, how can we make explicit, how can we help people realize they're already doing this, there already are development actors. And I think what Ege mentioned about the, sort of the great example of the Paso Cultural, that this is, this is something, it's already happening. It's just, it's not necessarily being, it's not always being celebrated. It's not being seen explicitly as a contribution, which is something that, I don't know, it's a relatively easy fix and we can really start to recognize that role. And once we start recognizing, make sure it's properly valued and properly supported. Um, I don't know if Minister Avogadro, perfect, over to you. So um, to build on over what Lloyd has said, which is really interesting, I would say that uh, one really important dimension is how we can build ownership, you know, citizenship ownership of our policies. Uh, that's a really huge challenge because if we are able to um, make people feel that they're stakeholders in what we are doing, um and co-responsible as i said before for these policies they will have more uh, impact for sure and will be um also stronger in terms of what usually happen in our countries and cities that it is in in, in some cases we have this uh, stop and go situation where you have uh, new governments coming in and and trying to build up uh, the will from scratch instead of continuing with, with uh, successful policies uh, and building on top of them. So uh, I think that um, ownership, it's, it's a huge challenge. And, and it's also um, a key uh, tool to, to have stronger um, policies and in that way, str a stronger impact in, term, in terms of uh, development. Thank you. I think that, that, that that's a really powerful 
it's a really powerful point and, and it, from what you were saying it's one you've done successfully in Buenos Aires I think that's a really interesting point as well when we're thinking about the sort of development agendas that the UN is promoting that these are not two or three year plans these are 15 year plans the UN is, is thinking long term and we need to do the same and in particular in cultural policy we need to do the same in order to adapt ourselves to that sort of framework I, I'm conscious this is also something that Stefan mentioned when talking that the the impact of efforts to, 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 to support regeneration, revitalization in Medellin. This was a 10 year effort. This wasn't something that happened overnight. I'm not sure, Stefan, if, if you're there, I think you, you might intervene the last to turn your camera on, you get the last word more or less. Stefan. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, my thoughts actually circle uh, especially around um, the, the current setting of the world, which is a little bit, uh, you could say we, we are in a multi-crisis uh, um, situation in many ways, um, wh wherever we are around the world. And this is definitely affecting people um, perceiving their own culture and identity. Um, Add on top of that that uh, as we as, as as it was mentioned before the the the, na the nature of culture is diversifying with with uh, with time so that it can arguably get even more difficult to draw people together to attract people to make culture something that um, attracts a community or gets them on the same ground um, both in terms of the um, physical space now we have lots of digital spaces um, but also just now in terms of what uh, the fears that people have of the future and um, the, the, the kind of subcultures that they're getting into. Um, so what I see as a, is essential for, for leaders, political leaders, but also on the ground for, for culture, um, uh, for people working with culture, um, is to, to be able to read these, these cultural mindsets, these fears of people, um, and understand that it only by transforming that into something that can be read through culture and through identity um, that, that these people can be given um, let's say hope towards the future whatever that future may hold um, and I think that that's something that um, again libraries are are doing all the time but it's oftentimes uh, that the leaders behind that those in action um, being able to draw people together uh, and 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 use culture for an identity building that seems to be absolutely vital in our days and i hope to see that more in the future thank you i think that again that's a super powerful point but this is also almost the importance of considering culture and addressing cultural issues through cultural policies is something that's not getting any less important that it is increasingly a determining factor so um we're running a couple of minutes over i did promise that i would launch the poll questions again so I'm just going to put those up on the screen in case people would like to sort of respond to those. And, and now I suspect we started out from a position of believing that we were, um, that obviously culture was very important, which is welcome, but also about the roles, the degree to which uh, culture is being taken into account in strategies at local, at the national level. So these questions are up there just in case you have, you want to feed back in. I'd be interested to see if there are any changes in the overall percentages there. So it's great. So we have our first first responses in. Very good. It's coming in quickly. So we're up to around half. So I'll just give you a few more seconds and then we'll draw this all to a close. All right, great. Right, we're up to 50%, over 50%. That's good. It's another 10 seconds. Okay, and I'm going to do with that. I'm going to end the poll and share those results so you can see them up on the screen. So it's good. The still there's a strong belief in the importance of culture, and at the I think the most interesting one is again at how well is culture integrated. Obviously, the denominator has changed, um, but it, the feeling is you no. Know, hopefully, what I'm feeling from that is this recognition that there is it is slightly better integrated into those local strategies, and that this is something that we can use as a lesson in order to inform what we're doing at the global level. So with that, I wanted to thank all of our speakers, Minister Avogadro, Ege, uh, Loida, Ayanda, Stefan. Thank you very much for your time. Um, the recording from this um, we will upload to, to YouTube. 
We'll share the link through the Culture 2030 Goal website. Um, do take a look there. You'll also find many of the fantastic resources that have been talked about during this session. And please do keep an eye on the site um, in order to follow what's coming up. We're certainly looking forward to participating at Mondia Cult, the big UNESCO cultural conference, and hope to work with you and with others in order to make sure that the potential for culture is realized in order to make for a more sustainable world. With that, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of the high level political forum. Thank you.